January 8, 1917, number 19th Squadron, RFC. I'm laying in my bunk. I cannot sleep as the events from the day play heavily on my mind. The bourbon shared by Captain Spear with me in celebration of my first victories has worn off and my head is now aching. I feel like I've already been at Grand Ruling Court for years, but it's been less than 24 hours. At 19, a fatherless kid whose mother thought it a good idea to keep a journal arrived here near Arras, France this morning, fresh out of training. My instructors told me I was a natural, but excitement soon turned to dread as I arrived at the aerodrome. A shot-up spad laid smoldering on the edge of the road, the body of a young chap still bit and broken, twisted inside the machine that no longer resembles what was flying probably less than an hour earlier. Captain Spear met me with a warm smile. The rest of the squad gathered around playing cards. I was told that I would have a few days to acclimate, but before I could even unpack, Major Edwards yelled out from the field office that for Captain Rollett to take 2nd Lieutenant Pentland and 2nd Lieutenant Salisbury and myself to immediately take off and fly out over Eris to check out the reports that there's infantry under attack in the city from German air machines. I immediately turned to Captain Rollett and asked him if I was ready. He looked at me and he said, I hope so. The kid that you saw when you came in this morning in the spad sure wasn't. I climbed in my new Sopwith Dolphin, the pinnacle of British flying technology. As soon as the engine started, the fear dissipated. As the aircraft lifted off the ground, I was home. We used to take off on these big squadron offensive patrols, usually in the afternoon, kitted up of course in our long sheepskin thigh boots and, and uh, leather coats and little sort of motorcycle helmets and goggles. And by the time you got all that in a cockpit, there wasn't much room, we were wedged into our cockpits. Ran our engines up for two or three minutes, water cooled engines, time to get them warm, and then took off severally and at about 500 feet we'd begin to get in formation and head slowly out towards the lines. We were about uh, 20 miles or so behind the line, so we had time to climb up on our way over. Our business uh, was offensive. That's to say we used to climb up to get height this side of the lines, and then when we got our height, uh, go over and look for trouble. And we usually got up to about 15 or 16,000 feet before we actually crossed the lines into enemy territory. Uh, this was a good height and, of course, very cold. Our eyes were, of course, continually focusing, looking, craning our heads round, moving all the time, looking for those black specks which would mean enemy aircraft at a great distance away. And uh, we'd be perhaps between clouds, you know, not be able to see the ground or any parts of the ground which would sort of slide into view like a magic lantern screen of something far, far beneath, clinging close together about 20, 30 yards between each machine, swaying, looking at our neighbors, keeping our throttles, setting ourselves just right so that we were all in position, as it were. And then sooner or later, we would find the enemy or spot the enemy.
You know, it's not really possible to describe the action of a fight like that because having no communication with each other, uh, we simply had to go in and take our man and chance our arm and uh, keep our eyes in the back of our heads to see if anybody was trying to get us as we went down. But there was always the point where you had to go down anyway whether there was anybody on your tail or not. And so the fight began at these altitudes and engaged and disengaged with bursts, perhaps 30 or 40 rounds, tracer ammunition, you understand, three, three in one tracer, so that there was always some idea of where you were fighting because your sights really were no good in these quick dog fights. There wasn't time to focus anything. It was, it was just really snap shooting. And so the whole squadron would enter the fight like that in good formation, but within half a minute the whole formation had gone to hell. There was nothing left except just chaps wheeling and zooming and diving and on each other's tails, perhaps all four in a row even, you know. A German going down, and one of our chaps on his tail, another German on his tail, another Hun behind that. I mean, uh, extraordinary glimpses one got, or people approaching head-on, firing at each other as they came, and then just at the last moment turning and slipping away. The fight lasting perhaps for altogether 10 minutes, a quarter of an hour, would, would come down from 15,000 feet right down to almost to ground level. By that time, probably ammunition exhausted, guns jammed or something like that, and then there'd be nothing left but to come back home again.